tonight, if you open your Bibles, to Mark in the fourth chapter. Mark in chapter number four, as we look at a parable of Jesus, those who are at school camp will remember I preached on this passage at school camp. And yes, now Lord gave me liberty to preach this message here at First Baptist Church. You remember I had four chairs in that message, and they're bringing four chairs out in just a moment out here to put up here. So Brother Ryan, whenever you're ready, bring those chairs out here. Tonight I'd like to ask you the question to consider, what chair are you in? You put them down right down front. Thank you. And you brought the big dog with you. That's right. What chair are you in? Mark chapter number 4, Jesus brings a parable that he begins to teach. A parable that on first glance doesn't make a whole lot of sense. A parable that at first glance you have to scratch your head and say, well, why in Sam's Hill is that in the Bible? If you look in Mark chapter 4 here, verse number 3 where the Bible says, hearken, remember that word hearken. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Lord, I'd ask for your help tonight again. Lord, there's nothing in me that can communicate this truth beside the Holy Spirit. And Lord, that's all I need tonight. I pray you'd give me the power that I so desperately crave. Lord, not for my own benefit, but for your benefit. You've promised that your word will not return void. I pray tonight, Lord, that that would be the case, that nothing would hinder your word from touching hearts. Lord, help us to consider and to search and to correct any thoughts, behaviors, and actions that don't line up with your word and what you've done in our life. Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I want you to look back at your Bibles, if you would, and look again in verse number 3, where Jesus says, hearken. Everybody see that? See that hearken? Shake him a rattle. You see that hearken? And look at verse number 9, and he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him, what does it say? Here. So between verse 3 and verse number 9, Jesus begins and ends with this thought, listen up. Listen up. He says, hearken. So listen, whatever you're doing, stop and listen to what I'm about to tell you. Now as a father, I can understand these words. Because sometimes my wife says, hearken to me. No, no, no. With my kids, I'll say, listen, Johnny, listen to me. And I wait until he's looking me right in the face. Now why would I do that as a dad? I'll help you. Because sometimes when he's listening, he's not listening. Selective listening. Sometimes my wife and I will say, how could two such intelligent people have three unintelligent children? Come on, those with kids understand what I'm saying, don't you? Those who, thank you, Brother Kent. All of us as we grow up, and those who are older will remember maybe when your parents said that to you, are you listening to me? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And we get real good as teenagers and as adults Listening, but not listening. Listen, don't try to fool me. You're in church every week. You have no clue what I preached last week. I could preach the same message all over again. You'd be like, oh, that sounded nice. I think I've heard that before. I could preach the one from this morning and some of you'd be like, wow, that was powerful, Pastor Howell. Yeah, the second time you heard it. Come on, we do a great job of listening and not listening. And Jesus makes a point to say here, hearken, if you have ears, listen to me. Growing up with Six brothers and sisters. Sometimes my mom and my dad would try to get our attention. They often run through names, never seeming to get the correct name for the child they're talking it to. I thought it was only you understand, Brother Shellhouse, don't you? 
Now, with only three kids, I go through names and go to colors and red and green and numbers, two and three, and the dog, Max, and the cat, Preston, and still can't get Danielle's name. I understand. She ripped through this. But Jesus comes tonight and he gives us a command. He says, hearken. A command to listen up. A command that if you have ears, if you have ears of not debating how well they work, how nice they are, what they look like, he says, if you have ears, then listen to what I'm about to tell you and listen to what I just told you. Pretty clear, right? Pretty clear, right from God's word. Verse 3, verse 9. Listen up. A command that applies to you and to me today. Listen up. Mark chapter 4. Listen up. But then he goes through some counsel. He goes through some counsel in verses 3 through 9. Some counsel about farming. Now, some of you know the end of this and what this means, but picture yourself a moment that you're with this group of people. He says, listen up, hearken. If you have ears, listen here. He goes, a sower went out to sow. A farmer went out to spread seed in his field. We have some people who like to grow vegetables in this, and, and a farmer, Brother Aaron Bays, does a tremendous job out there in the fields. Thankfully, Brother Bays, this is in the Bible for you. In case you didn't know how to farm correctly, Mark chapter 4, 3 through 9. Now you have a good idea how to farm your field correctly. He gives us some farming counsel. Now Jesus doesn't say hearken and listen up very often like this and, and not many places do you find it wrapped between two, two, two verses like that. But nowhere else do you find this besides the other place that repeats this where he says listen up and tells us how to be a good farmer. I had to ask myself why would Jesus to this crowd, now we know why at the end, what do he say? Listen up. I'm going to tell you how to sow a field. I'll help you. Because it was important. He gives some, some counsel, some, some strange counsel. So strange that after the counsel, I see confusion. If you would look in verse number 10. And when he was alone, that Jesus was alone, they that were about him with the twelve, those with the disciples, asked him of him the parable. So picture this, Jesus has just commanded that everyone listen to him as he talks about farming. And he ends it with, make sure you take note of that. Highlight this in your Bible. Circle it. Don't forget when you go in the field and there's rocks and there's seeds, this is what you have to do. And the disciples are sitting there scratching their heads. There's some confusion. Lord, and it was probably Peter who asked, right? We don't know that, but probably Peter. You ask, Peter. He'll listen to you. Peter, you ask, all right? Here, Peter, I'll give you a dollar if you ask. Okay, I'll ask. Lord, why are you talking about farming? Lord, why are you talking about sowing some seed? Lord, what in the world do you mean? Let me just pause here real quick. That's a great question. Because sometimes you're going to read in God's Word, you're going to hear from God in your life, and it's not going to make sense at first. And if you don't search out what He means, you're going to miss what He means. Jesus was talking about farming, but He wasn't talking about farming, was He? And some were content to say, oh, that's really nice. Let me go sow some seed. But some said, Jesus, what did you mean? Jesus... What were you trying to teach us? Lord, I heard what you said. I listened up, but I'm a little bit confused. You ever been confused? Maybe about something you're reading God's Word? Lord, I see what you're saying, but, but what are you saying? Lord, I hear what you're saying, but, but what do you mean? I'm a little confused. I want to obey you, but Lord, you need to make it clear for me. I see the command. I see the counsel about farming. I see the confusion. And then in the goodness of the Lord, I see the clarification. And that's what we're looking at tonight, the clarification. Starting in verse number 13. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? A little bit of a rhetorical question the Lord asked. What? You don't understand this parable? Have you not spent any time with me? If you can understand this one, then everything else I teach you will make sense. Do you understand the significance of what Jesus is saying? 
He's saying that this parable here, here will unlock other parables, will unlock some truth from God's Word. He says this in verse number 14. The sower soweth the Word. Remember in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. He is God. He said, the sower soweth the Word. And these are they that by the wayside, where the Word is sown, and when they have heard Satan, cometh immediately, and taketh away the Word that was sown in their hearts. Tonight I have four chairs up here. Four descriptions of different types of heart or the soil of our heart. Tonight, with God's help, I want to present to us these four places that our hearts can be at. Jesus only gives us four options. And we will all be in one of these places. There are no other choices, just these four. If there had been more, then Jesus would have given us more. That makes sense, doesn't it? Doesn't take a rocket science. He says there's just, there's just four places. Tonight I have some paper like I did at camp, but I want you to see, I want you to remember this with the Lord's help, four places. The first one tonight. Somebody help me here. What is that? Snatched. Snatched. I'm going to place it here so that we remember it tonight. Snatched. Jesus says that the sower soweth the word. That means that he has in this particular parable maybe a bag by his side, often the way that they would sow in the field in those days. And the sower would come and stick his hand in the bag and, and then spread out the seed. Seed was expensive. Seed uh, was, was not everywhere, was not easily accessible. So the seed was precious to the sower. He didn't want to waste the seed. And he sowed the seed. And yet the Bible says that when this seed was sown, when the word was sown, when they have heard it, Satan come immediately and taketh away the word. It is snatched away. Every time you read God's Word, the Word is being sown in your heart. Every time you come to church and hear the preaching of God's Word, the Word of God is being sown in your heart. It is like I am reaching in a bag of God's Word and sowing the seed of God's Word. You hear the truth in the songs of God. They are sown out there. And yet the Bible says that the Word of God can be sown, but it can be snatched. can be snatched by others. I told the young people that I was out soul winning when I was in college in Greenville, Greenville, South Carolina. Came upon a young man, a young lady. Had a track with me, a couple tracks with me. I asked if I'd give them a track and if they're sure they're on the way to heaven. The young man with a rebellious and just a defiant look said, ha I want to go to hell. I have since that time, never had anyone say it to me that directly before. I think he was trying to be funny, trying to be cool in front of his supposed girlfriend. She kind of hit him and said, oh, don't, don't talk like that, and kind of laughed it off and giggled, but would you be surprised that she wouldn't listen to God's Word either? God's Word can be snatched by others. I remember two young teens at a youth rally sitting by each other. Well, the Word of God was being sown, while well, the Word of God was being preached, and, and one was just cutting up and messing around, and would you be surprised come invitation time that neither one responded? The Word of God can be snatched, can be snatched by others. I've been to a lot of camps with our young people, a lot of camps, summer camps school camp, some winter camps in there as well. 
And I've seen our young people, our teenagers, sitting there, and I've, I've seen where one is receptive and someone next to them, someone around them is cutting up and messing around. You know what happens? The Word of God is snatched. It's being sown, but it's snatched. Snatched by others. It can be snatched by influences. You're reading your devotions. Spending time with God and your cell phone buzzes. What do you do? For some people, they pause in their time with the Almighty. They pause their time with the one who sits on the throne of the heavens. They pause their time with the one who has redeemed them and yank out their phone to see. Distracted. Sometimes it happens in church, doesn't it? Don't think that we're not in a spiritual battle. We ask for cell phones to be silenced, not because we're draconian about it, but because we don't want anything to hinder God's Word. You've heard it before, right? When maybe I'm giving the gospel during that time at maybe a particular point of the Scripture, and all of a sudden a phone rings. I remember years ago, I'm sitting down here right about where Brother, Brother Kemp is right there, maybe a row up. I sat in the second row, not the third row. Obviously a better Christian in the second row, no doubt about that. No. Right back there, and right about where Maddie's sitting, um, a phone rang, and it was when they had those, was those Nextel phones, those walkie-talkie phones, you know, beep, beep, someone started talking right behind us, I think you're with me, right, honey? And the lady answered, I don't know if you remember this, the lady answered during church, beep, beep, where are you? I'm at church, beep, beep. I'm sitting there like, this is unreal. How can you do this walkie-talkie bit out loud during church? But she was. When are you going to be out, beep, beep? What else you know? I don't know. Beep beep. <laughs> Put your phone away. Beep beep. Snatched. Snatched by influences. Don't let God's word be snatched from your heart. See, sometimes we put ourselves in places for the word of God to be snatched. If your phone causes God's word to be snatched, you know what? Turn your phone off. If it bothers you in church, then for heaven's sakes, leave it in the car. All right? It's okay. There's no rule that says you have to have your phone in church, right? Don't let God's Word be snatched. We already have enough distractions as it is at church. Don't add to it. Amen. You say, Pastor, why did you sit up front so many years? Were you trying to get in good with Pastor Let? No. I sat in front because I get distracted in the back of the church. Now, I'm not against you sitting in the back, all right? I'm not preaching against the back row Baptist, though I could, all right? Don't get me started. This is what I do. This is just me because I'm not a very good Christian. I'm sitting in the back, right? Or sitting in the, and when we, Johnny was born, we'd sit back there and someone would have to go to the restroom, right? What would you do? Then they come back in. Now don't tell me I'm the only one because I see you in church. I still have good eyesight. 2015 and 20, or 2010 and 2015 eyesight. I can still see you. Distractions. Now, once again, I'm not preaching about where you sit. That's a different sermon, all right? But you understand distraction. God's Word can be snatched. And you and I can place ourselves in the position for God's Word to be snatched. I don't want God's Word snatched out of my heart. If it comes in the form of a phone or someone going to the restroom, I don't give a rip. I don't want to be in this seat. Because God's Word is sown, yet it's snatched. It's snatched by others, by influence, and sometimes it's snatched by Satan. The whisperer comes in and whispers. I know that he says that he's good, but he's not really good to you. I know that he says that he loves you, that God in heaven, but it doesn't seem like he loves you, does it? The snatching of God's word. You don't need that. That pastor saying that stuff up there, but it's not really for you, but it's for that guy across, that girl across the auditorium. They really need that. Pray for them right now. Snatched. God won't really hold you accountable for that. It's not really a big deal. My friend, don't listen to the lie of the devil. He is attempting to snatch the word of God out of your heart. First area was snatched. Verse 16 and 17. If you look there, the Bible says, And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, receive 
immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time afterward. When affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. See, there's another group. First one snatched. Second group. Help me here. What is it? Shallow. You see it there? You see in the scripture how they're shallow. The word of God is preached. The word of God is received. And they receive it with gladness. They're glad to have God's word. They're glad to change. They're excited about what God's doing. They're excited about what God's saying. They're excited to listen to the word of God. Yet they're shallow. They're unwilling. They're unwilling to suffer it all for Jesus. I'm not talking necessarily about persecution where your head may be threatened to be cut off, but that's definitely included in this. I'm talking about they're not willing to get up late or to get up in a Sunday afternoon to come to church to suffer for Jesus. They're unwilling to have commitment. Did you see that? What it says is they receive with gladness, but when affliction or persecution, or basically, whenever it doesn't become comfortable, whenever it's not convenient, whenever it actually is concerning, then they're done. They're done. You mean, I actually have to live this stuff? I just can't say amen? They're unwilling to have friends reject them because they take a stand. They're unwilling to allow someone to think poorly of them for Jesus Christ. Why do we care what people think when we're trying to please Jesus Christ? They're going to think I'm weird, Pastor. No, you are weird. But you're also different as a Christian. We're called to be different because of His holiness. They're unwilling to make a commitment that costs anything. This is great. Oh, I got to serve every Sunday? I'm not so sure about that. I don't know if I can make that commitment. You see, I got a lot going on in my life right now. A lot going on in my life. Boy, if you knew what I had going on in my life at home, boy, it's, it's, but, but when I get things turned around, Pastor, I'll be glad to serve. They receive their word with gladness. But when persecution or affliction ariseth, every Sunday morning on a bus, you do know it gets cold in Michigan, don't you, Pastor? No, I didn't realize that. You know it gets hot in the summertime. Yeah, it does. You know that then I can't get to the restaurant as fast as somebody who doesn't ride the bus. You know that, don't you? Yeah, I get it. I got to sing in front of people like people are watching me. They're going to watch me. I got to do that. Shallow. Shallow. Commitment of time, commitment of service. You find sometimes that even people you expect to understand don't understand. We've gone out um, to visit Dreams Extended Family. They don't all go to church all the time. Extended Family. And they'd schedule a family meal when we go to church on a Wednesday night. We had to tell them, we'll be in church Wednesday night. But that's your one time to come out to New Jersey and every cousins and everyone will be there. I'm sorry. Going to church Wednesday night in a different state on vacation. In the house of God, with the people of God, hear the preaching of God. Because I don't want to be shallow. Just because it's not convenient for me. Because, it, because it's going to cost me something. You see, Jesus says that there's a second group, and it's a group that's just shallow. God save us from shallow Christians. Shallow Christians come to church. Shallow Christians receive it with gladness. Shallow Christians make good decisions. That's what they do. Shallow Christians have a great expression and great joy. But shallow Christians have no depth. You see, shallow Christians are unwilling. Tonight, if you're unwilling to respond to God, it means you're shallow. There's a third 
group that Jesus talks to us about. Verse number 18 and 19. He says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. There's another group. There's a snatch group. There's a shallow group. There's a group that's what? Suffocated. Suffocated. If we're not careful, we can suffocate the Word of God in our lives. The Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, the Word's been sown. But then there's been some deceitfulness that has come along. Or that this particular group of people have been deceived. They've been bece- deceived by riches. Or by the almighty dollar. By the almighty dollar. Remember years ago I had a, had a young teenager. Had a job and worked through church on a Wednesday night at McDonald's. I talked to this young teenager. I said, you work through church. How much did you make? We figured it all out and it was somewhere around $12.50. They traded time with Jesus Christ for $12.50. But how much do you trade time with Jesus for? Now, I realize there are times that work requires us to be away. I understand there are some professions that that do that. But how about the overtime? Well, you don't have to. Deceitfulness. But pastor, if I do this, then I can can give more money to the faith-building offering. My friend, you can't buy your way out of this one. We don't sell indulgences at First Baptist Church. We're here to please Jesus Christ. Deceitfulness of riches, deceitfulness of the cares of this world. We can be distracted not only by money. The Bible says we can be distracted by things that just weigh us down. Our house, our car, good things. Good things. Other responsibilities in our life. They can deceive us and cause the Word of God to be suffocated. We can be distracted, the Bible says here, by the lusts of other things or by recreation. Distracted by recreation. This particular group, they've received the Word and they want to grow, but all of a sudden, life comes around. Life begins. And all of a sudden, when the Word of God was powerful, Now it's second to this event, to this care, this concern. Suffocated. To think that we can suffocate the power of God in our life by something so mundane as recreation. I heard of a church recently that offered a very early morning service, and I have no problem with that. If we ever needed to, we'd go to two morning services. I have no problem with that. But this was their advertisement. Come to church and still get your 10 o'clock tea time. But somehow, church, its normal time, would prohibit you from golfing. So let's make sure that you can still come to church and you can still golf. Once again, I'm not against a morning service. And an early morning service or two morning services. I'm against selling it so that you can have more recreation in your life. That's what I'm against. If we're going to have more church, it's not so that you can now go golfing more or to make sure you can just say, we're going to go because Jesus wants us to. Suffocated. There's one more group here. Verse 20. Gets just one verse. But it's the most powerful verse, I believe, in the entire passage. Where Jesus says, And these are they which are sown on good ground such as hear the word. That means they're in the place to hear the word. They have the ears to hear the word. They have the mind and the spirit to receive the word. They hear the word and they receive it. And it bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. There's one more group. It's this group. 
successful. The Word of God's been preached, been read, it's been heard, it's been received. And it begins to bring forth fruit. Brings forth fruit in other lives touched by Jesus Christ. It brings forth fruit in an attitude. All of a sudden, a man who was a jerk to his wife, now he's a loving husband. That's the fruit of God's Word. A wife who was not kind to her husband, now she's kind. Why? Because God's Word bears fruit. A child who was rebellious now is turned toward God. Why? Because the Word of God is received. And it brings forth fruit. I want to be in that chair right there. I want to have a successful heart. One where the Word of God can come in and just bear fruit. Sometimes, God's Word gets snatched from me. Sometimes, I'm shallow. I'll be transparent. Sometimes, I'm shallow. Sometimes, I let God's Word be suffocated. But I pray that God's Word in my life will be successful. And look at the end of that verse. Isn't there three levels of successor? Do you see that? You know which one I pray for? You know a prayer request that I have? You can pray for me this way. I pray that God's word will bring a hundredfold in my life. I'm not content for fivefold. I'm sorry. I'm not praying for twentyfold, for thirtyfold, or for sixtyfold. That's not what I'm praying for. I pray for me in my life, a hundredfold. You know, I pray for my kids and my wife, a hundredfold. I don't know exactly why in this verse, and Jesus doesn't tell us why there's different levels of the fruit. All I know is, I know which one I want in my life. I don't want to be content, oh, give me half a harvest. I know of no farmer ever who asked for a low-yielding crop. And I'm asking God, in my life and your life, to take His Word. And I hear it and I receive it, but God brings forth the fruit. All I can do is put myself in one of these seats. My question tonight to you is, which seat are you in? You can say which one you're in, but inside your heart, between you and God, you know exactly, exactly which seat you are in. You know If right now, your time with God is characterized by the Word of God being snatched away. You may be going through the motions and from the outside it looks good, but you know if God's Word is being snatched. You know, between you and God, if in your heart, though you look good on the outside, you're just shallow. You know. You know. You know if in your heart God's Word is being suffocated. Not allowed to reproduce. And you know. You know. If your heart's right here. This is obviously where we're supposed to be. And can you imagine what God could do in Saginaw, Michigan with a church who says, I'll hear your word. I'll receive it. Lord, bring forth a whole bunch of fruit. Lord, don't just bring forth one little plant. Don't just bring forth, Lord, bring forth a hundredfold. Can you imagine what God could do here? Why doesn't He? It's not because the Word of God is not powerful. In this explanation of the parable, the Word of God is the power. There is a result. It's always connected in this parable to us in our heart. So where are you at? Lord, I thank You for Your Word. Lord, I pray that You would convict us Lord, show us the path that we're on. Don't allow us to be deceived. Lord, help us. This church, this congregation, Lord, to allow your word to have freedom in our hearts and lives. Oh God, would you give us a hundredfold of fruit in every single life here. I wonder if God touched your heart tonight. No need to wait for us to stand. If God touched your heart, you respond. You respond. The altar is open.